This is the story of James Brazier, a story of hard work and dedication, racism, jealousy, and police brutality in the 1960s. If you want to know more about this story, please continue watching. James Brazier was born on January 30th, 1926. He and his wife, Hattie Brazier, were parents to four kids, two girls and two boys. Brazier served in the U.S. military during World War II and was later honorably discharged. Sometimes Brazier would work two and three jobs. And one of his jobs was working at the Chevrolet dealership in Dawson, Georgia among many other places that he had worked. He had bought a car that was from that dealership where he worked, which was a 1958 blue and white Impala. A police officer, Wayman Birch or Burchelli Cherry, arrested Brazier and took him to jail in 1957. After he returned home, his wife, Hattie, said that he told her that Cherry had stomped him in the head and back. Brazier had told her that um, Wayman Cherry said, I'm going to get you yet. And Brazier responded, what do you want me for? And Cherry said that you, you, are, you are a nigger and you're buying up all these cars and people like us can barely live. Now, I guess you would say that this indicates envy or jealousy on the part of this white man who's a police officer. And it's kind of funny because seeing as he's a police officer and he makes less m money than this black man that he's arresting. And this would later prove to be fatal in Mr. Brazier's case. Remember I said that Mr. Um, Brazier had said that the officer, Officer Cherry, stomped him in the back of the head and also other places. Uh, Brazier's wife, Hattie, said that when um, he came home, not only did he have blood coming out of his ear, he was also vomiting blood and she could still see Cherry's shoe print on her husband's back. Now, you have to stomp somebody pretty hard for you to be able to still see their shoe print on the person's back. But yet again, this was the 60s and this was something that was normal for a black person to have to go through, even though it is cruel just because you're jealous of this person's comfortable lifestyle or what you perceive as comfortable, even though... They have to go through a lot of racism, racism, which this poor man unfortunately did and died as a result of. Now, five months prior to all of this happening, um, James Brazier and his father, Odell, um, Pastor Odell Brazier, sorry, uh, were coming home from church after they had been in church all day because if anybody has ever been to a black church everybody knows that that church is like it never ends like you might get there at 10 o'clock in the morning and might not leave till two or three in the evening um so as after the church had let out he his father odell uh brazier had got into 
an earlier model car of James Brazier's and drove the family to their homes or their destinations where they were going. And James Brazier, his son, did the same thing. Now, it's strange because as he was driving his family, you know, to their destination, an officer by the name of um, Randall Enos McDonald. And when I saw his middle name, I thought of something else, which is very immature to say, but you can guess it by his middle name, which is Enos. Um, I saw that and I thought of something very immature to say, but um, he actually pulled over Mr. Odell Brazier and said he was supposedly speeding and he was weaving um, and accused him of being drunk and, you know, driving reckless, recklessly, which I'm pretty sure this man was not drunk by a long shot because everybody knows if you're in church all day, like most black churches do last all day, um, chances are you're not going to move until the church service is over unless you have to use the restroom or whatever the case may be. Now, this officer said that he was speeding and driving recklessly and weaving, you know, on the road. Um, so they proceeded to like try to force him into the back of the police car, but another policeman, um, took out his, um, nightstick or club and hit Mr. Odell on the bridge of his nose and in both of his eyes with it, um, which, you know, left his eyes, I'm pretty sure messed up for a while and he probably couldn't see for a while. Um, but Mr. Odell said that, you know, he wasn't speeding cause he wasn't drunk and he was driving safely, but you know, I'm pretty sure the officer saw that as a form of back talk. So they slammed him on the ground and threw him into the police car. Now, in the midst of this, James Brazier, his son, walks up and sees that, you know, this is his dad that they're roughing up. And he quickly walks towards them and say, hey, don't hit my daddy. And in the report that I read, they considered this to be a form of back talk and considered him to be what some would call uppity and, you know, felt like he should have known his place as a black man. And since he didn't, they felt like they had to, I guess, teach him a lesson. Um, But after that happened, it gets worse. Now, I have to backtrack a little bit and go back to April 20th of 1958, the day that everything actually took place, and tell you a little bit about that day. Now, as I stated earlier, Mr. James Brazier and his family, which included his father as well, Pastor Odell Brazier, um, spent that Sunday like they do every Sunday, which is in church with their family. Um, now, on this particular day, Mr. James Brazier, he was driving home, and he just happened to see, like I said earlier, that police officers had a, another, or what he assumed at the time was another black motorist um, stopped on the highway for no reason. But when he got closer... He realized that, hey, this is my father that, you know, that y'all over here, you know, holding up like he's some criminal, which he's not. And at that time, like I had said earlier, Brazier told them, you know, don't hit my daddy. Um, And so this uh, officially signed his death warrant, so to speak. And after this... um, It got worse because later when they, after they had, you know, been, you know, doing whatever they were doing to his father, when they got him to the, you know, jail, um, they went to Brazier's, James Brazier's house and, you know, met him in the front yard as his neighbors was watching. They said, 
What did you say you were going to do to me? Officer Cherry had, you know, asked him. And Brazier was like, I didn't say I was going to do anything to you. Um, and he basically told him, yes, you did. You're telling a lie. So then, you know, they tried to arrest him. And he, you know, he struggled because, you know, apparently if you feel like you didn't do anything wrong, you know, you're you're going to struggle. So they basically were telling him, like, you know, you're going to pay for this and things like that. And so Brazier was like, you know, pay for what? I didn't do anything to you. So then, you know, in the midst of him struggling, his wife tells him, you know, just comply with the police. And then one of the police officers says, I ought to blow your goddamn brains out, you know, which that's how, you know, a lot of police officers talk to black people. And I'm pretty sure they said some other things along with that. Um, And his son, which was 10 at the time, tried to intervene just like he had done hours earlier with his father. But they swatted him away like he was nothing and continued to basically, you know, struggle to get him in the police car. And when they got him to uh, the jail, he was in a pretty beat up condition and, you know, they asked him, how did you get that way? Or they didn't rather ask him, how did you get that way? But they sent a doctor in, which was white, um, to quote unquote, look at his injuries. But the doctor being a white person also, he didn't ask Brazier, how did you get this way? What happened to you? You know, who did this to you? He said he never asked these questions. He just assesses the injuries that the, you know, victim or individual has and in this case he wrote it off as you know brazier being drunk or whatever because you know even though he seen that brazier had lacerations about his head and his back and everything he wrapped them up and just wrote it off as him being drunk because he he was slurring his speech but you know as we all know now that's a sign of a concussion and so later, his wife, um, well, actually, let me go back a little bit further. So later on that night, after the doctor said, told him, hey, y'all might want to keep an eye on him for a couple of hours. In the late night hours or early morning hours, a cell um, individuals in there in other cells nearby told, told um, a reporter later that they saw the cops, Officer Cherry, and I think a few other officers come and get Brazier out of his cell as he pleaded to be left alone. And a few hours later, before morning hit, they returned with him wrapped in a U.S. Navy uh, flag blanket and put him on his bed, which, you know, basically soaked his blood. And... um. When his wife came to get him, you know, he was so badly beaten and she knew that he wasn't drunk or anything, but she piled him and her family in, you know, the car, drove him to the nearby hospital. And one of the doctors standing outside said, you know, after she pleaded for help, one of the doctors standing outside, which was a white man, because mind you, this is Dawson County, Georgia, and there are no black doctors if any around at this time this white doctor looked in the car and said oh ain't nothing wrong with that nigger he just drunk and he needs to go home and sleep it off his wife Hattie Brazier told the doctor you know she said doctor he's not drunk he is obviously hurt and he needs you know help so she drove him to Columbus, Georgia, which was like 60 miles away at, you know, during this time to another hospital and, you know, went there and told the doctors, you know, my, my husband needs help, you know, um, something's wrong with him. He's been, you know, beaten up or whatever. And so the doctor, um, you know, which is, I guess, friends with or works with the other doctor that saw him earlier in, in the jail, uh, tells, you know, another doctor, you know, they're in a room, they're, you know, having a conversation about this. And I don't know what he tells them, but obviously he tells him enough to get him to, 
you know, help him, quote unquote, or at least look at him. And so he comes out and says, okay, you know, we're going to keep him, you know, whatever, after a lot of pleading or whatever on on um his wife Hattie's part, the doctor says we're gonna keep him and you know we're gonna work on him, and then a couple of hours later, this man comes back, looks this woman in the face, and says, "There's nothing I can do for you, widow." Basically declaring her husband dead while he was still alive, because I guess at this time they let her go in there and see him. And he was, you know, clearly still alive and they had did, I guess, x-rays or whatever and, you know, decided that there was nothing they could do for him. And seeing as, you know, he was a black man, even though he had given his life to serve this country, they felt like he was worth nothing more than, okay, we're just going to look at him and, you know, just to get her out of our hair. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's so heartbreaking to know that, this was in the 60s and stuff like this is still going on today and it's even worse today you know but i just hate it for this man and his family that you know nothing was done even on the behalf on the part of the officers after they had beat this man to death they were not locked up or anything and it's just horrible if you guys like this video, please don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. See you guys next time.